So this is Krishnakant uh, working as an assistant professor at Symbiosis School of Economics. Uh, well, this session is on COVID-19 and employment scenario. The COVID-19 pandemic has triggered one of the worst job crises since a Great uh, Depression. For the past couple of years, we all have gone through many uh, challenges and problems that has come to us. So in this session, we are going to uh, look beyond our personal experiences to address systematic issues due to this pandemic. We have some eminent speakers who will be sharing their views and thoughts on this uh, topic and its impact on the labor market. So uh, I'll start uh, with the introduction of keynote moderator, uh, who is Professor uh, Santos Merotra. Uh, he's visiting professor at University of Bath. Uh, he's currently, uh, he currently advises to Niti Aayog, Ministry of Labor and the Ministry of Skill Development and is a research fellow at the IZA Institute of Labor Economics, Germany. Uh, you have already listened to him yesterday. Uh, now we have uh, three uh, eminent keynote speakers, starting from uh, uh, Professor Lisa Magnani. Uh, she's a professor from Macquarie University, Sydney. Uh, she serves uh, as an editorial member and reviewer of several international reputed journals and is also a member of many international affiliations. She has authored many research articles and books related to labor markets, employment, wages, and environment uh, sustainability. Next, we have uh, Dr. Rana Hassan, a regional economic advisor, South Asia uh, uh, Department ADB. <clears throat> he heads the Country Program and Development Results Group, which works closely with the government to develop ADB's annual operations in India and ensure that they align closely with the priorities and objectives of the country uh, and ADB's own long-term uh, development uh, framework. He holds a degree, a uh, doctorate degree in economics from University of Maryland, USA, and completed his master's in economics from Delhi School of Economics. And finally, we have <coughs> Dr. Mrinalini Jha, assistant professor at uh, Jindal Global University. She completed her PhD uh, from Delhi School of Economics at uh, University of Delhi. Uh, her doctoral research focuses on economics of discrimination and unequal opportunities in economic well-being and their impact on growth. She was a postdoc uh, research fellow at Ajim Premji University at the Center for Sustainable Employment. She was also prime contributor to income inequality and poverty analysis in the State of Working India 2021 report. So I welcome all of them and uh, I hand over the podium, the dice to uh, Santosh sir. Sir, you can start. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Dr. Roy. Um, Lisa and Rana, can you hear me? You can, you can, uh, yeah, you, you'll need to unmute yourself very soon because of course I'm going to ask Lisa to start. Uh, Lisa, I hear that you might have to go to the airport. Will we be, so you, you might not stay for the entire one and a half hours? Is that right? Is that right? Thank you very much. Oh, it's, I'm just returning uh, from an airport. <laughs> Lisa and Rana. Will, but I'm asking you whether you'll be able to stay on for question and answers till the end of the session, which will be in an hour from now. You can. Oh, wonderful. Okay, super. Thank you. And Rana, I am assuming that you will, of course, be able to stay on. You, I assume you are in Delhi, right? No, I'm, in Delhi and I'm I just returning from an airport. <laughs> Sorry, say that again, Rana. I think there was some, oh, yeah. Please go on, Rana. Sorry, I cannot Sir, hear you. Till the end of the Dr. session. Uh, which was, right, right. Oh, you oh, can't no, hear me. <clears throat> Uh, okay, we've, you can't, but okay, you heard me say, can you stay? So you heard me, but you are not hearing me very well, quite clearly. Um, can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay, good, good, good. So I need to keep the mic closer to myself. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that uh, tip. Uh, but you will be also staying on for, uh, for another hour because we have a one and a half hour session and we have three speakers. Okay, super, fantastic. 
So the order which uh, we will um, proceed in is uh, Lisa first, then Rana, and then we'll have uh, Imran Alani, who's right here sitting next to me. So uh, I'm, without much ado, without any introductions, uh, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Dr. Magnani to start. Lisa, the floor is yours. Yes. 20 okay. minutes, I'll give a warning signal at 15 minutes. I hope that's OK. Thank you. In my um, right desire to participate to in this so, lovely conference, um, I was I'm, also participating ado, in the inaugural uh, event of FICO uh, conference uh, last Magnani year. No, in 2019, actually. Yours. It was not last year yeah, because of COVID. So here I am. I'm sharing now my screen. I hope that's okay. Uh, and uh, wonderfully, we get to wonderful. thank you all uh, for. Um, uh, accepting my um, desire to second. participate in this lovely conference. I was also participating in the inaugural event of FICO conference uh, last year. No, in 2019, actually. Just one so second. Not last um, year because of COVID. I have to find so here I am. I'm sharing now my screen. The correct the and uh, hopefully we get to... Um, uh, Lisa, can I ask you to pause for a second? We are trying to sort out some s sound issues here because uh, we've got a reasonably large audience waiting to listen to you, but um, your voice is coming through rather faint. Uh, so they're s trying yeah. to sort out the... the la uh, Lisa, ma'am, can you try using a headphone? Lisa, ma'am, uh, is it possible for you to use headphone? We can't hear you. Me now. Um, we can hear you now. Can you hear? Can you feel? Use a headphone with a with a mic close to your mouth, please. We need you. We need you to use a a mic which is as close to your mouth as is possible, please. Mm. Can you hear me now, better? Can you hear me now? Okay, ma'am, could you please mute your uh, system speakers? Try muting your system speakers. System speakers, not the Zoom uh, system. Your uh, laptop speakers. They are all uh, muted. Now this is fine. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you okay. hear me now? Ma'am, could you please mute your... Yes, we can hear you now. A little better, certainly. Wonderful. Try muting your system so speaker. System speakers, not the. Uh, who are sort of many seas away. Um, Rana and Lisa, I'm going to request you to hold off until these technical issues are resolved. I'm sorry about this. Uh, meanwhile, we are going to, I'm going to ask Dr. Mrinalini Jha, who's assistant professor at Jindal Global University, to start her presentation. So she'll be the first speaker, and then we will res uh, resume the old order, which is uh, Lisa followed by Rana. Okay, so Mrinalini, uh, the floor is yours. 20 minutes. Time's yours.
Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. That was some start. Um, so I have to begin by uh, thanking the organizers for having me here, uh, especially uh, Dr. Chand Chandi Ramani and Dr. Um, Sudipa. It was a last minute thing, but I'm extremely happy I could make it. Uh, and I speak for all of us that we are overwhelmed by the warm welcome and the top-notch hospitality. So thank you for that. And now, absolutely. Thank you very much. Now, we are in the last uh, track of FICO 2023. And the focus shall uh, continue to be on the working population engaged in remunerative work. Okay. However, for the purpose of my talk, I am going to zoom in a bit and talk about the remuneration part. And I'll do exactly what's written on my, uh, in my title, which is to track the income trajectory of Indian workers. And we will start from the time uh, of the pandemic, which is 2020, and go all the way up till uh, uh, 2021 end, which is close to two years of tracking the recovery. Now, um, uh, for the sake of the international audience that we have here, uh, it will be nice to spend a minute on this chart, which does a couple of things quite well, I suppose. Um, we can read off three things from this chart. The first is the shaded background that you see in grays and blues and yellows. So what that is telling us is the period of the lockdown, um, the post lockdown, the second wave and the post second wave. So those are the four backgrounds. Um, from the left-hand axis, you can read off the COVID-19 cases, which is given by this red line there, okay? That red line, all right? And uh, the other two curves that you see in orange and purple are the Google mobility numbers, and they can be read from the right-hand axis, which is the percentage change in visitors, really. So we are seeing that mobility dropped... Um, in, in, in its to, to really the rock bottom during the phase of the lockdown. Remember the right hand axis is all negative quadrant. So it was a minus 100, minus 80% drop vis-a-vis -vis normal times. The peak of the first wave interestingly happened in September, right? So that was way after the imposition of the lockdown. Uh, the second wave we all know uh, was deadly. And thereafter, if you look at the last segment, which is the gray one, we see that uh, the COVID-19 cases have been steadily falling and the mobility uh, has been steadily going up. So that's a broad picture of how the, uh, how the pandemic manifested itself in our country. Now, if I want to talk about the economic impact on this, remunerative, uh, on this uh, working age population, uh, one way to do so is to classify them in two broad categories, the first being um, the impact on employment and the second being the impact on income. Now, when it comes to employment, uh, we now have a very um, uh, fairly nuanced understanding of what was happening to the different aspects of employment, uh, the different measures of employment. You heard um, uh, Professor Deshpande today, uh, you heard Mahesh uh, Vyas speaking yesterday, and all of them have contributed uh, in enhancing our understanding of what was happening to employment. Today, what we will do is to talk about a couple of things. We'll talk about the immediate impact of the pandemic on incomes, that is income levels, on income inequality, on poverty. We will trace how equal or unequal has been the, uh, the recovery, the path to recovery. And eventually, I'm going to link it all up, both the impact and the recovery, uh, to the kind of employment that workers have been engaged in. A quick overview to give you the sense of the economy as we speak today, okay, before I go in the past. Uh, I'm drawing this from, uh, from, uh, from uh, Professor Himanshu's work. He, uh, he teaches at JNU, and he has this excellent uh, op-ed piece, which I'll urge you all to read. It, it was there last week, I think, in the Indian Express, and these figures are coming from there. Um, so if you look at casual workers, which are essentially daily wage workers, uh, these folks um, who are working in non-agricultural work have not seen an increase in their real income in the last five years. There has been no significant increase in how much money they earn. For those who were, occupy, who were employed in the agricultural um, occupations, they saw an increase of 0.1% per annum on an average over the last five years. That's close to nothing, right? 
What's interesting is that together they form more than 75% of the rural workers. So we are saying more than 75% of the rural workers did not see any increase in their real income in the last five years. We might think that, oh, you know, things may be better for the regular salaried workers uh, who are supposed to be the ones employed in the most secure form of jobs, right? Notice that for both rural salaried and urban salaried workers, there has again been a drop in the real income that they have been earning in the last five years. In fact, it goes beyond. So in effect, what we are seeing is that today as we speak of income of these workers, real earnings has dropped for 83% of the All India workers in the last five years, 83%. Okay. Whatever work I'll be presenting today is coming from CPHS. You've heard enough about it, so I'll just skip over this. Um, what I'll do is take you through very simple pictures so that everyone is with me. And we'll try to see what is happening to incomes through different, I mean, in different ways. So here, it's a very, very simple plot. All I'm doing is plotting the average monthly income in real terms, constant prices, at the All India level, which is the middle line, the green line. Uh, for the rural sector and the urban sector separately, okay? Now, there are a few very clear takeaways. One, everything fell, everything dropped the moment the lockdown was imposed. The bottom peak, uh, the bottom, uh, well, trough that you're seeing, that bottom point is at April, is in April 2020, which was the first month of full uh, nationwide lockdown. What we see is that the drop in the urban incomes was far, far, far worse than that in the rural income. Um, thereafter, the economy began to open up and, well, everything started climbing back up. But interestingly, even by December 2021, that is two years since the beginning of the pandemic, we had not reached the pre-pandemic levels, which means we had not gone, the average incomes for these folks had not gone back to, the, to that of February 2020. And that's saying something, keep in mind the time dimension here. But people can argue that, well, um, it was, well, the nature of the crisis was such that it may be um, wise to look at longer durations. Things were very volatile, right? Everything was moving at a very fast frequency. So month to month variation will be huge. So what about the state of these people in different time periods? So for example, how are they doing during the lockdown vis-a-vis -vis the pre-lockdown? How are they doing in the post-lockdown vis-a-vis the pre-lockdown and so forth. So I do this entire analysis at a cumulative level over the time periods which I mentioned, okay? So pre-pandemic, lockdown, post-lockdown, second wave and post-second wave. I have two graphs, I'll take you through one graph, very interesting graph, uh, it's rural urban, so I'll, I'll follow urban throughout, story remains the same. So what we are plotting here is really the growth incidence curve. What that, what that means is, on my y-axis, I'm plotting the proportionate change in average per capita household income. And I'm doing this for every percentile, okay? Um, I'll take you through the red line. Um, first thing is please, of course, note, everything is in the negative quadrant, okay? This, this horizontal axis, everything is lying below that, so everything is the negative quadrant. The red line is telling me, it's plotting the proportionate change in income um, in the lockdown period as compared to the pre-COVID period. What does that mean? What was the drop, in this case the drop, what was the drop in income in the lockdown period as compared to the pre-COVID period for people belonging to different percentiles? It's as simple as that. And we see that there's a clear regressive nature to this drop, right? What do I mean by that? The poorer you were, which means the more left you were on the x-axis, the poorer you, you were, the sharper was your drop in income during the lockdown period as compared to the pre-COVID period, okay? Look at the bottom five percentiles. The bottom five percentiles. These folks lost 100% of their income as compared to the pre-COVID period. That's massive, right? However, um, everybody lost income. Of course, let's please be very clear. Everybody lost income. The top percentile lost around 20% of their income as compared to the pre-COVID period. We do this for different time periods, different combinations, but you look at the green line, which is the topmost line, that is plotting the proportionate change in income in the post-second wave period as compared to the pre-COVID period. 
Well, that means in the last stretch of 2021 also, everybody continued to make around 15 to 20% lower income as compared to the pre-COVID period. However, the regressive nature has kind of uh, become muffled. Okay, let's take a quick look at what was happening to, uh, what was happening to poverty. Now, we all know in this audience that uh, in the lack of an official poverty line due to lack of data, we take into account different thresholds. What if they were the poverty line? How were we performing in that case? Okay, so let's talk about the national minimum wage. In the pre-COVID period, 32% of the rural population and 18% of the urban population was lying below the poverty line. Notice what happens during the lockdown, jumps up more than twice. Now 62% of rural population and 56% of the urban population lies below the poverty line. What is interesting is jump straight to the uh, post second wave period. Even after two years, poverty levels continue to remain inflated as compared to what they were pre-COVID, right? It's still 36% for the rural and 24% for the urban population. We are not back. The story changes when we talk about inequality. Inequality did jump enormously during the lockdown period. However, uh, so let's, let's um, for the sake of time, look at the Gini. So Gini was 0.44 in the rural areas, jumped up to 0.51 during the lockdown. However, has gone back to 0.44 during the post-lockdown period. So there was uh, an increase uh, uh, in inequality. However, as the economy began to open up, in terms of inequality, we have gone back. In terms of poverty, we see numbers continue to remain inflated. Now, all of this is well and good, but we all know that different households are uh, their, their resilience to, to a crisis depends, um, is, is, is different, right? Depending on what characteristics they have. Not every household is equally equipped to handle, handle, handle any kind of crisis. So, and that's the reason um, we use a regression framework, right? I'll be very happy to talk about the event study which I have done, but for this audience, I'm going to skip forward and show you the results. Very happy to talk about it um, uh, later, the math of it. Quickly. Okay, so now remember we have taken into account that oh, households are poor, households are rich, all of that we've taken into account and still we see that uh, the drop in incomes for the urban sector was of the magnitude of 45% in, in April as compared to their February incomes. Thereafter, recovery happened. But even in December 2021, urban incomes continued to remain 10% below their February incomes, which means recovery was far from complete in the urban areas. In rural areas, we see there's a lot of fluctuation. However, they seem to be back on track. I'm sorry, I'm rushing through this. Um, I will spend a minute, actually. The red dotted line, the vertical line, is on February, okay? And the horizontal dotted line is on zero. And what I'm plotting is the proportionate change in income vis-a-vis -vis February. So rural people, what is the proportionate change in income vis-a-vis -vis February in each month? Same for the urban folks. And that's why we are seeing that every drop is vis-a-vis -vis February, which means the pre-pandemic uh, the, the pre uh, month. Okay, I do the same analysis for different income deciles. So what I do is that I am going to see what was the drop in incomes really through a regression framework. So we are controlling for a bunch of things. Through a regression framework, we see what was the change in income for people belonging to different deciles and how was the recovery, okay? Again, um, it's a very, this is a very um, pretty graph. Um, I mean, just like visually, because you see a very beautiful monotonous drop. You, you see this drop here happening, right? just for, uh, without, without wanting to be too repetitive, these are, we are, what are we plotting? We are plotting the drop in income vis-a-vis -vis February, okay? So drop in income for the bottom decile vis-a-vis -vis their February income. Bo uh, drop in income for the top decile vis-a-vis -vis their February income and so forth. What are we seeing? The poorer you were, the sharper was your drop. It's very beautifully aligned. It's very monotonous. The, uh, the poorer you were, the sharper was your drop. The richer you were, the lesser was your drop, okay? So what do you see here? See, this is all negative, right? So it's minus 100 here. 
we are seeing that the bottom two deciles in the month of April and May 2020 lost 100% of their income vis-a-vis -vis their February incomes. Okay. As compared to this, the top decile in April 2020 dropped, uh, uh, lost 20% of their income as compared to their February income, February levels. So that's fine. Okay, we get you. The poorer you were, the sharper was your drop and so forth. But see what's happening to the recovery. It's, it flips, right? And how does it flip? What happens is that the poorer you were, the sharper was your recovery. Five minutes. Oh, God. Okay. The poorer you were, the sharper was your recovery. And the richer you were, you kind of saw a stagnation. Do you see that? Look at this brownish line. 20% drop, sure. But, well, even till December 21, you've kind of remained at 18 to 20, right? But what about the bottom deciles, the poorer folks? They are, they are actually above the zero line, which means they have reached the February levels. What really explains this? Let's, let's talk about that. Our hypothesis is that it's the occupation channel. I'll draw you two parallels, and this is really the last thing I'm going to talk about. The more contact intensive your job was, the more informal your job was, and the less secure your job was, um, the, sh the, 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 the worse were you affected, right? Overnight you lost your job, there was no protection. Now these folks, folks who are doing these jobs, typically tend to be located in the left hand of the income distribution, right? They're the poorer folks, correct? Now, look at two things. Lower deciles saw the sharp drop, sharp recovery. These people think of wage earners, wage labor. Wage labor also saw a very sharp drop in income, correct? Because they lost their, uh, their jobs overnight. However, the moment the economy began to open up, they will rush out and fetch uh, in, in, in search of new jobs, because of which they will also see a very sharp recovery. You see that? However, uh, the more, the other way around, if you think of white collar workers, they do have some protection against immediate layoffs. So they saw a slower drop in incomes, right? However, those who lost their jobs took time in coming back. Why? Because there's a longish procedure to again get them back to their jobs. Um, that's what we show in these tables for which unfortunately perhaps I don't have time. Um, but again, happy to talk about this later. I'll forget the summing up as well. Uh, but I will spend a few, like maybe two minutes on this. So, so then what am I saying? Am I saying that the poor are out of the woods, because well, sure, they suffered, but I've also shown you the recovered, right? And that is where I think as empirical researchers, we have to become careful of the question we are asking. What is the question we are asking? We are looking at recovery or impact in terms of income, correct? Now think about the folks who I showed were making zero incomes for two months, yeah? These are people who typically don't have a lot of savings. They are already marginalized and vulnerable. You, they, they, they lose jobs for two months. How are they going to survive? If I could ask, I would ask, but basically too, long, too, too big a crowd. So they will survive by taking loans, right? And this has nothing to do with indebtedness. Have I mentioned indebtedness anywhere? I haven't. So recovery in terms of what becomes important. Furthermore, indebtedness is perhaps easier to measure if it was done through formal sector. These are folks who are typically likely to go to informal sources of borrowing, which is even harder to track. So even as we see that their income levels have gone back to the pre-pandemic levels, it is important to remember that it's only income that we're talking about. We do not have any idea of their state of indebtedness. We don't know about their nutritional intake. There are a lot other, several other parameters on which we cannot comment yet on what is their status as we speak today. I think I did fine on time. I will end there. Thank you. Dr. Jha, that was fantastic. That was spot on. And thank you for that very enriching presentation. Um, we will now go directly to Dr. Lisa Magnani, followed by Dr. Rana Hassan. And uh, my techie colleagues are going to brief you, Dr. Lisa, about the modality. Uh, we have 
two possible, we have plan A, and if that doesn't work, we have plan B, and uh, our techies will explain that to you. So over to you, Thank Madam. You, uh, Lisa, ma'am, you can just try once again. Yes, Lisa, ma'am. Yes, we can. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Fantastic. Okay, so I can start from now. Am I correct? Absolutely. Floor is yours, Lisa. Thank you. thank you. Okay, so thanks so much. I really uh, appreciate the presenters of conference. It's taken a while. development goals and particularly poverty particularly particularly in the context of fragile economic frameworks where poverty often is embedded and uh, um, many of these sustainable development goals uh, um, such as gender equality health as have been uh, shattered by the COVID-19 pandemic so um, of course, it's a very complex and multidimensional issue how the COVID-19 pandemics has affected, but I will try to focus on the um, economic impact and particularly the firm level impact in two particular um, uh, domestic national frameworks, the one of Vietnam and the one in Indonesia. Uh, to do so, I summarize the COVID-19 pandemic uh, aspect as a shock. These um, are manufacturing facts. So we know that manufacturing has been one of the uh, most severely impacted sector in the global economy um, in two ways. You know, think about the shocks to the Chinese uh, manufacturing production from January 2020 to February 2020, and then later on uh, the shocks uh, in other parts of the world, uh, such as the US uh, or uh, um, even India uh, later on. Um, these manufacturing effects in general have two kind of effects, supply effects and demand effects. Supply effects uh, because of course, uh, the supply by firms is impacted and uh, the um, Chinese Wuhan uh, reaction to um, most recent reaction to um, the nth um, wave of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown uh, very well that supply can be deeply impacted, but also demand and the demand effect can be unequal and sector specific. Say for example, the demand for uh, tourism and tourist uh, uh, services can be 
deeply impacted. And so this is again, one of the uh, most striking effect of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have also logistic effects in the why these shocks are propagated through the network of this global production uh, system. And we have people affect particularly through the um, health impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. One of the most neglected um, aspect of these effects are the policy effects. Even the policy we adopt can have a global effects by impacting these global production networks um, and uh, propagating the through the chain uh, these blockages and uh, and uh, uh, difficulties in uh, uh, keep going with the with the economy. At the level of a global supply chain, uh, resilience has often been centered on four four key questions: uh, diversification, uh, the localization of manufacturing as a response to the propagation globally, to the global propagation of these shocks. So should I, should we be more local in our production? Should we be more digital to avoid the, the sort of human to human transmission of, uh, um, of these uh, uh, pandemics? And uh, uh, finally, can, uh, um, can uh, um, a different modality of uh, production, say more customer oriented uh, is required uh, because we change the, um, you know, the modality of dealing with uh, these pandemics. Of course, uh, these are all four very complex questions and I can only uh, give uh, uh, broad brushes to address uh, those. But uh, I want the first to remind our audience that these uh, global modes of production and the resilience issues that we are facing, that we have faced with the pandemic are certainly not new, but not terribly old either. It, the context of development has changed dramatically in the, since the 50s when we were talking about modernization, dependency, world systems, and we were living in a post-colonial world in a, a direct contact with the colonial uh, world of the previous uh, centuries. The 70s and 80s have been dominated by issues of uh, um, industrialization and particularly import substitution and then export oriented industrialization. And it's only in the 90s that we have a boom of these global modes of production through global commodity chains, global value chains, global production networks more, most recently. And then uh, uh, starting from the 2000s, really the emergence of new economies the booming of new economies in the context of these global modes of production and these uh, uh, booming economies include India and Russia and, uh, and a few others. Uh, what we often forget is that in particularly since the 90s, the uh, global production network has been dominated by trade in uh, intermediate manufacturing goods. And you can see here India, uh, Indonesia and Vietnam. I really would love to have the time to speak of the three, but uh, for uh, time constraints, I will focus uh, on a few selected issues related to Indonesia and Vietnam. But you can see a little bit the rate of growth of uh, the trade in, in intermediate goods uh, from uh, to, like, from the um, uh, the late eighties to two thousand and six, this is really the moment of the widespread uh, emergence of these global modes of production and the rapid rise of uh, um, and the rapid rise of um, um, the 
uh, global production network. Uh, sorry, I wasn't scrolling down. So you can see here in this slide, India, Indonesia, and Vietnam, and the growth of intermediate um, goods uh, trade from 1988 to 2006, the moment in which this global production network really become dominant as a mode of production. What we mean by global production network is a complex intertwining with development. And we often speak about compressed development in the sense that global modes of production have accelerated the <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> have accelerated the pace of development, but also created an uneven pace of development. So the emergence of uh, pockets of poverty, uh, regional uh, distribution, uneven distribution of poverty have gone hands in hands with this global, uh, the emergence and development of this global modes of production. What is also important to understand the impact of COVID-19 pandemic is that in global modes of production, the few activities that are part of the chain, the production chain become more valuable than others. So production is probably at the bottom of the added economic value in a commodity chain, while a pre-production and post-sales activities become really, really important in terms of value added within the commodity chain. And what we see in many nations is a race towards these high value added activities such as research and development or design or on the post-production uh, side, we have the post sales and retail services and marketing. What we see then is the rising importance of intangible capital as opposed to physical capital. And this is important to understand the constraints and opportunities for uh, smaller countries or larger countries in our region in the post-pandemic world. What do I mean is that if we compare the distribution of value added within a commodity chain before the 1990s and after the 1990s, we see a dramatic change from an inverted U-shaped curve that sees the peak value produced in the manufacturing phase of a commodity chain, we have now moved to a U-shaped curve where value is produced in the pre-production phases, such as research and development, and in the post-production phases, such as marketing or sale services. So what we have seen in the longer term are waves of deindustrialization. So we see the share of manufacturing in total employment rapidly declining in the UK, in Italy, even in South Korea, if we think about what happens after the 1990s, and uh, you know there are some signs of uh, you know not really growth driven by industrialization, even in Brazil and South Africa, where these uh, uh, shares of manufacturing total employment have been relatively flat over the decades. So we have seen a decreased importance in the production side of uh, a commodity chain and uh, in the uh, manufacturing sector allocation of employment at the same time. 
So what uh, are the, these trends uh, and these aspect of global production network? What do they really mean for countries in our region? For example, Vietnam and Indonesia. I would love to have more time to include India. In fact, uh, my original plan was to also include India, but uh, given the focus on India of some other speakers, uh, I prefer to enlarge the focus on non-Indian uh, national economies, such as Vietnam and Indonesia. So if I think about Vietnam, what is striking is the economic structure heavily relying on small and medium enterprises. This is not unusual at all. In fact, it's quite similar to the Australian economy, or we can think about the Indonesian small and medium enterprise and its heavy weight in the overall economy and its uh, employment share um, or in the overall employment creation. So what are the um, challenges for countries such as Vietnam in a post COVID-19 recovery? Well, clearly participation in global value chains is an ongoing process and it's uh, very much supported by policy initiatives. But we also have to remember that uh, there are two types of participation in these global modes of production. One is direct through connection with the uh, foreign direct investment, for example. But the other one is an indirect uh, participation via subcontracting, often involving agents, firms, and workers in the informal sector. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm conscious of uh, the wonderful previous presentation in this track that really emphasized the importance of understanding the informal economy in India, but also in Vietnam and in other Asian countries. So Lisa, what you we have see five more here minutes. You is have a five real challenge for the typology of engagement with the global production network, mm -hmm. with global value chains. So um, policy in Vietnam have aimed to do three main things. In general, to, um, yes. I was saying you have five more minutes, Lisa. Okay, thank you, thank you. So um, really strengthening the participation in this global production network, but also strengthening uh, the ability of small and medium enterprises to uh, participate in the private sector. And we have seen a lot of uh, um, um, improvements and ongoing challenges in terms of technological change, for example. But uh, let's uh, talk for a moment about the real challenges for small and medium enterprises. One is the credit uh, contraction that often demand the contraction, the demand side of the impact of COVID-19 as meant for these small and medium enterprises. And when we have financial constraints, often we have the need to support these small and medium enterprises and to support their ongoing investment in innovation. So here we have, um, in Vietnam um, um, reports on plants, the dark blue, and ongoing, um, yeah, ongoing uh, um, investment in uh, investment plans for 2020. And we can see that, uh, you know, the dark blue reflects the in, in plan, the, the ongoing plans to invest 46 Yes, uh, I have invested, I kept investing 
in uh, um, in my innovation um, um, in innovation and technological change investment. So the outlook is quite good for all these small economies, uh, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, and Vietnam. But clearly, there is a need to keep um, looking at the typology of investment and the red signs indicate uh, from 2019 to 2020, some of these areas, some of these countries have undergone cuts in this investment. So remember that this kind of investments are important to capture value in the global commodity chain. The distribution of values have changed um, you know, through these global modes of production. And it's very important to I invest in activities away from direct production and towards the pre-production and post-production phases of participation. So what are the ongoing challenges for Vietnam? Well, limited access to finance, particularly for small and medium enterprises. There is still integration in global modes of production that needs a support. Skill and workforce scarcity are very much uh, um, an issue for Vietnam. And the diversity of organizational structure, including those uh, informal organization that participate heavily in the um, in the informal economy. Okay, I need to cut a little bit the, the presentation on the palm oil on the Indonesia that was very much a center on the palm oil industry. And the, um, I want to skip a little bit um, the sort of history of this industry because we all know that it has grown enormously. What the pandemic really means uh, is uh, um, this kind of transformation. So the pandemic will impact on the plants, um, the, uh, the MP3 EI program, um, part of uh, the 2025 plan for Indonesia. This is uh, a in focus on increased productivity away from heritage and natural resources towards the creation of uh, new modes of uh, income and new modes of value creation towards capital and technology, towards skilled and labor intensive, towards innovation and human capital intensive industries. So the palm oil industry is an example of heavy reliance of natural resources, heavy reliance on uh, extractions from nature and the Indonesian uh, government is embarking on, has been embarking on an ambitious project away from natural resources towards uh, um, increasing economic competency in high skill and high tech industries. Now, what remains uh, to be asked uh, are some pressing questions. Um, the, um, the, the relationship of industries such as palm oil industry on natural resources is, has been uh, um, defined as problematic on so many grounds, not only on the grounds of labor, but also on the grounds of its environmental impact. So uh, a pressing question that the COVID-19 pandemic poses, can we look at heritage in another way? And can we look at uh, uh, the past in a critical way? For example, does the arrival of plantation, such as uh, prevailing modes of production in the palm oil industry, really equate with prosperity and rural development? And uh, rather, does the shock to global production network in this heritage reliant sector represent an opportunity for innovation towards a, um, a more uh, a kinder um, development and a, a more attentive development to the needs of uh, the population and to the needs of uh, sustainable uh, growth?
Lisa, I hope you're moving you to your conclusion. Oh, great. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. It's okay. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed for giving us this international perspective. Very kind. Okay, without any further ado, uh, Rana, the floor is yours. Rana, are you there? Uh, yes, I am, Santoshi. So please uh, let me just uh, share yeah. my screen. Absolutely. I'm getting a message saying this will stop other screen sharing. Do you wish to continue? So I guess yes. Um, and here goes. So I wonder if you can see my screen now? Yes, yes. Fantastic. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, to the Symbiosis School of Economics. Uh, really delighted to be there. I wish um, I could be uh, participating in person, but uh, it was not to be. Uh, nevertheless, uh, let me uh, first uh, uh, just set some context. Uh, and I have to say that I'm not really going to be talking uh, too much about COVID. This is really the um, only slide where I talk about it. Um, the first uh, point is that the economy, the, the good news, the good news is that the economy is approaching its pre-pandemic growth path. So if you look at this chart, we have this uh, dashed line, which takes, uh, you know, previous five years growth pre-pandemic and, and sort of just fits a simple trend line. Uh, if growth had just continued the way it had five years pre-COVID, you would have seen uh, uh, GDP levels just uh, ex expanding steadily, as shown by the black dotted line. But the blue line is is uh, the reality, the, the pandemic hit, um, and, and uh, together with all these lockdowns and, and, and country-specific, um, the, the lockdowns globally, uh, we saw this uh, big reduction. And of course, there was a, a massive health um, uh, event also. So all of this leads to this uh, hit in GDP, and, and we're slowly getting back. Now, the hardest hit from the economic perspective, and you know, I'm not going to talk too much about this, uh, Dr. Jha gave a superb presentation, uh, really going into the details. But from the, uh, uh, you know, from from uh, whatever we 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 know, essentially three things seem to be very uh, um, uh, uh, common uh, across economies. It's the context, uh, the contact intensive services, and the informal sector, which uh, took the biggest hit. Uh, women uh, in 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 different ways, uh, both within the labor uh, force, uh, also outside of the labor force. Um, and uh, finally, learning losses among children. Now, I just want to say one thing about this third issue, the, the learning losses among children. Um, you know, when, when the pandemic happened and, and people talked about uh, kids being out of school for, uh, initially, you know, people thought, okay, this is going to be about a month. Kids will not, to go, not, not go to school for a month. You know, it's, a, it's okay. Uh, but this thing, of course, just dragged on and on. And um, we... We really, if we look at what history tells us, um, this is very concerning uh, because, uh, you know, there's been some really, really good rigorous work looking at uh, lessons from history. And in particular, there's an excellent uh, Journal of Labor Economics paper, which looks at the long run educational costs of World War II, where they were able to basically track uh, a, a cohort of Austrian and German school kids uh, born in the 1930s. Uh, these were cohorts where World War II had this uh, effect of um, uh, seeing these kids really not be able to go to school for about six months to a year when, when, when the war was really uh, 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 it, it, absolutely affecting those locations where these kids were. Uh, and, and what's quite amazing is that even 40 years after World War II, so all the way up to 1980, so these kids had become, you know, uh, 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 much older, they were hitting the end of that, uh, uh, the, their working lives. And even after 40 years, uh, these cohorts, um, their labor incomes were just not what uh, uh, the corresponding cohorts, which hadn't gotten uh, uh, schools disrupted. So that, that's, uh, that's, that's really to um, emphasize that these learning losses can really have long-term effects. And uh, we really need to be thinking about uh, you know how to how to make sure that these kids who've been through this uh, very traumatic uh, uh, episode in terms of their uh, educational attainment, how uh, how we can make sure that we, you're not going to see these types of long term effects that we have uh, in the past. So really, really important uh, issue. Um, now, with that, let me uh, just uh, say you know tell you why I'm going to focus on on. Uh, um, 
uh, trends, uh, even pre-pandemic. And I'm focusing on the Indian economy. And this is a very interesting chart that was put together by Sadit Chinoy and uh, Toshi Jain at uh, JP Morgan. And they, they had this really nice paper in the India Policy Forum uh, a, a year back. And basically they, they were looking at the pandemic and they made this point that, you know, let's, let's be very clear that even pre-pandemic, the economy was slowing down. Now that's, that's a well-known fact, but what they, what they really brought attention to was that between 2002 and 2010, India's growth pattern, India's growth drivers were really looking East Asian in the sense that investment and exports were really driving the economy. Uh, when, you, when you look at the 2012 to 2019 period, it's really consumption, private consumption, government consumption. You can see that the you know, role of investment has really gone down. Exports has uh, uh, become even uh, less important as a driver of growth. So one has to ask this question, okay, you know, we, we were not, we, we had started to slow down and the growth drivers themselves were changing. Uh, what's going to happen in the future? And have, have, we, have we tackled the problems that, that got us to this uh, slowdown? So that's, that's really a challenge I see. And, and like I mentioned, it's, it's really something that predates COVID. So when you put some of these COVID effects and what was happening prior, uh, we, we, we face an important uh, uh, challenge. Now, the, really, this is the context in which uh, my colleagues and I, uh, Shalini Mittal and uh, Kriti Jain, uh, you know, we've been looking at uh, uh, some of the data. This is very preliminary work, but uh, we wanted to look at what's been happening to jobs and wages in that period where Sajid Chinoy uh, reminds us that um, the drivers of growth, not only has growth slowed down, but the drivers of growth have changed. So, uh, you know, what we've done is we've basically taken the PLFS from 2018-19 that's, that's your cleanest pre-COVID uh, year information on labor force surveys. And we've looked at the 2011 uh, NSS employment and employment surveys and, and, and uh, uh, juxtaposed the data from these and, and uh, combining these with uh, information from national accounts. So um, notwithstanding you know, the slowdown, the fact is that uh, the economy was still one of the fastest growing in the world, one of the fastest major economies uh, in the world. But when you start digging into what's been driving this growth, and here what we've done is we've basically uh, used the household uh, uh, production side of national accounts as a proxy for the uh, unorganized or informal sector. Uh, and, and, and this is a series that uh, RBI very helpfully also uh, has been providing. Uh, what we find is that growth over this period um, has really been driven by the organized sector. So that's those are the... Uh, you know, uh, orange part of the bars. So uh, fire, which is basically finance, insurance, real estate. And, and here in uh, fire, I should mention, we also put these, you know, high-end business services. Uh, so this has been a big growth driver, uh, much of it uh, in the organized sector. And then you look at manufacturing, uh, uh, you know, second most important driver of growth, but really very heavily driven by the organized sector. And you begin to realize that, uh, you know, from the perspective of workers, uh, the, the, the situation is, 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 is not so great because uh, about, I think, uh, you know, Radhika is there um, perhaps uh, somewhere in the audience, but as Radhika's work shows us, uh, a good 70 to 80% of manufacturing employment in India is in the or unorganized sector. So, uh, which is hardly contributing to growth as, as far as national account statistics are concerned. Um, so uh, this, is, this is where you start to see, okay, uh, you know, th this is where maybe the trouble lies. Now, one of the things we, we've done uh, uh, is we, 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 we've considered a simple scenario. Um, first of all, you know, we, we looked at where are the workers and, and what is sectoral productivity? So basically, again, combining uh, national accounts data for 2018 with the PLFS 2018, and, and I should say that this is the current weekly status uh, workers only, uh, you, you, you begin to see India's problem. The problem is 40% of your workforce is in a very low labor productivity sector. 12% uh, 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 in construction, which by the way, this is a very high share. I mean, when you look at the share of construction employment uh, in, in other developing countries, it's rare to find a country which has about 12%. Uh, but uh, be that as it may, a lot of workers in construction, and again, very low labor productivity. 
manufacturing higher productivity, but uh, again, uh, you know, it's about 12% employment, not, not so much. And of course, uh, this green bar that I've shown you doesn't account for the fact that a lot of this uh, uh, productivity is driven by the organized sector where the, the employment share will be very low. Now, uh, we asked ourselves this question, okay, uh, what would it take for India to become an utter, uh, upper middle income country by 2035? And uh, basically, we said, okay, look, there are many, many pathways, uh, but but let's 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 ask this question about uh, what happens if India's employment shares in 2035 remain what they are today. So, in other words, agriculture still remains at 40% employment, construction at 12%, manufacturing at 12%, but the productivity of these sectors starts to mimic the average upper middle income economy. Um, and, and basically what you see is that uh, if, if, if India can engineer um, this, this uh, productivity increases to match the sectoral productivity of the average upper middle income economy, uh, what you find is that um, gross value added growth, so you can approximate that as GDP growth, would be about 5.9% per annum. Uh, and the Gini coefficient would actually decline a little bit uh, from, from the 0.45. Uh, th this is the genie in wages. It would decline a bit. So we call this the productivity effect. So you're keeping employment shares constant and you're just saying, okay, what happens if productivity goes up? Now, what's interesting is we say, okay, but how about workers moving into higher productivity sectors? And this is what we uh, call the em uh, uh, employment effect when employment simply shifts from the patterns that we see in India in 2018 to the employment shares that we see in uh, the the uh, uh, average middle income country, and here what you find is uh, you, you you have a quite a massive increase in labor productivity, and in fact uh, it's equivalent to the uh, Indian economy growing at uh, about uh, almost eight percent of GDP growth, and the Gini falls uh, even further to 0 0.40. Uh, now, uh, what what this is telling us is. Uh, it's, it's okay, it's very important to have productivity growth within sectors, but you also have to have shifting employment. Employment has to shift to uh, sectors with higher productivity. That's when you're really going to be in a situation in 2035 where you've not just got growth, but you've got an inclusive uh, growth. Now, um, issue number two is just, uh, you know, we've been interested in, in, again, going back to the past and seeing, uh, you know, what have been the employment shifts been like? So the first thing I, I uh, the, the main thing I just want you to take away from this chart is that it's not as if agriculture uh, employment has not been going down. Definitely, India's employment has been going down, and certainly for wage workers, uh, this is the chart on the left hand side. Uh, these orange bars, you see quite a big reduction in wage employment in agri in agriculture, and 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 these are essentially uh, 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 employment seems to be shifting more towards uh, construction trade. Um, Surprisingly, public administration and personal services, hardly anything much happening in manufacturing. There is some, some increase in uh, 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 the, the share of wage workers in manufacturing, but uh, not all that much. Um, if you look at the urban sector, uh, it's, it's, uh, the manufacturing uh, increases are, are even less. Uh, so employment uh, shares, in fact, have declined. Uh, the big drivers of employment are um, the, these these good jobs in in finance, insurance, real estate, uh, uh, business services, etc. A little bit in public administration, uh, trade, uh, 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 um, uh, wholesale, retail trade, and also personal uh, services. And uh, overall, uh, employment, uh, not surprising, is shifting from rural to urban areas. Uh, that's that's we 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 see that uh, uh, from the left hand chart by this big negative. Uh, bar, uh, orange uh, portion of the bar chart that, that shows you that wage workers, there's been a more than six percentage point exit from uh, uh, the rural sector. And where are they going? They're going to the smaller cities and towns. So the big cities here, this is the, uh, uh, this is basically, uh, these are cities that had a million or more population uh, in, in the 2001 census and, and uh, 1.5 million or more in, in the uh, 2011 census. Um, and and uh, the chart on the right is just uh, uh, magnifying what you're seeing in the urban areas. So it's it's basically um, small cities and towns is where a lot of the employment action is taking place. Now, I, the only thing I'm going to say about this is this is unusual. If you look at the East Asian experience, 
you will find that big cities, big metropolitan areas is where more and more concentration of workers uh, and, 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 and uh, people took place. So uh, uh, this is a bit of a deviation from the East Asian process where big cities became even bigger. And, and probably uh, what, what, what that meant is uh, they, were, they were exploiting agglomeration economies over more, uh, even more. And, and I'm going to come back to this point at the end because I think it's a very important uh, uh, point uh, for future research. And I hope uh, you know, uh, students uh, um, uh, who are interested in doing research look, look into these issues in, in more detail. Another thing we find is that urban work is shifting from routine manual work to non-routine analytics. So this is based on occupation data. And, and, and this pattern is, is a very familiar one uh, across the world. Uh, you see this decline of routine manual jobs and, and, and uh, it's uh, why exactly it's happening. We need to dig deeper. I don't want to say that this is the fourth industrial revolution at all. It's probably premature. I don't know how much fourth industrial revolution stuff we've really seen in urban India, quite frankly. Um, so uh, uh, let me just turn to wages. Uh, one piece of good news is that uh, wage growth in small cities has become higher uh, uh, than, than in uh, large cities. Of course, the level of wages, they tend to be the, the highest in big cities. And, and uh, please, uh, please note that these are real wages. Uh, we have uh, tried to adjust uh, 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 for both spatial and temporal uh, uh, differences in uh, uh, cost of living. And the way we've done that is by taking the 2011 official poverty lines and, and, and you know, just breaking these down into rural, urban, and, and state-wise, and then taking uh, the, the state and sector-specific uh, inflation rates and, and uh, uh, just, just uh, 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 e extrapolating the cost of living uh, implicit in the Indian poverty lines in 2011 to uh, 2018. Um, Another thing that we see in this chart, interestingly, is that if you look between 2012 and 2018, you, you, you see a bigger increase in rural uh, wages uh, uh, than, than you see in uh, uh, wages in, in cities and small, uh, 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 small cities and towns, big cities and small cities. Um, and I know Dr. Menotra has done a lot of work with that, uh, so would be very interested to hear what he has to say about that. Uh, this is pretty much my final slide, and I uh, promised I'd get back to it. Uh, cities are very, very important for both India's growth prospects and, and, and jobs prospect. Uh, please mind you, I'm not suggesting at all a neglect to agriculture. I think raising agricultural productivity is simply a given. Uh, we, we simply cannot be talking about inclusion uh, if, if we don't uh, 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 have agricultural productivity growing uh, 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 fast. But, Rana, but, five minutes. Uh, Rana, five minutes. I'll just take two, uh, Santoshi. Thank you. So the, the the thing that I want you to take away from this chart, basically, where we have uh, uh, taken uh, wages and reg regressed them on a, a bunch of uh, demographic characteristics of workers, uh, but also the characteristics of the enterprises they work in. And in particular, we, we have information from the NSS labor force surveys on whether wage workers are employed in firms with 10 or more workers. Uh, we take that as a proxy for whether your firm is formal or not. And, and essentially what we see is if you're working in a formal firm, even after having control for age, uh, gender, your years of schooling and, and your residence, you're, you're paid better. Um, we, you also find that uh, if you're in a large city, uh, you, you're paid better. And interestingly, returns to education are higher if you're in a large city. So that, that, that almost tells you that, that larger cities value education more. It's, it's not only where more educated workers are, but they do value uh, uh, workers more. One very interesting uh, takeaway um, uh, for us was uh, the, 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 the dummy on, 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 uh, on uh, whether you're female or not. And uh, this is negatively signed, which basically means that given whatever our observables are, uh, if, if you're a woman worker, you get paid less. Uh, now, uh, uh, this, this is a, uh, a feature which you see in many, many countries. You, you see these negative uh, coefficients on, on, uh, on, 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 the, on, on the female dummy. These tend to be a bit larger. Uh, if you looked at data from Philippines, uh, there would be less of a gender uh, uh, gap. Uh, uh, gender bias, but I, I, I think what's interesting here is that uh, this gender gap is actually less if you're in large cities. And in some other work, what we've seen is this gap turns to be less if you're working in the formal sector and you're in a large city. 
So it's it's in that sense, you know, uh, I, I think the promise of urbanization and 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 the formal sector are are, are very much seen in the data. So just uh, summarizing, lots of employment remains in the informal sector and in low productivity, low wage sectors. Uh, we really need an acceleration in structural change. And, and here we're using the Macmillan Roderick definition. Structural change is when employment moves from low productivity to high productivity sectors. Uh, as I said before, increases in agricultural productivity, absolutely critical. Um, and and uh, I'm going to skip this penultimate bullet point and just make this case for cities that, that we, we, we really need cities to be acting as uh, stronger engines of growth and, and uh, jobs uh, than they have been. And for this, our cities are going to be need to be managed better. This is some work we're doing with Niti Ayog. I'm not going to talk more about this, but hopefully uh, in, in a couple of months, we, we'll have a report on this. Um, so with that, uh, thank you very much. So Thursday, I'm done. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hassan. Um, in the interest of time, since we lost time at the beginning, for technical reasons, I'm going to pass on making any comments. Dr. Hassan and Dr. Jha, I know both of you, we are all in Delhi. I'm going to give back. Uh, Santoji, we, uh, I, I cannot hear you. I don't know if Lisa... Okay, I'm going to uh, speak a little louder. I'm going okay, to speak no. a little louder. This so is, this my, is the same problem. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, okay. we uh, I just wanted to say, you, Mrinalani, and I are all in Delhi. We can speak. Um, uh, you'll have my feedback uh, in Delhi when I'm back. So I'm going to pass on making any comments because we've lost time at the beginning. And I'm going to open the floor to the, to the audience so that our young students and our young faculty can ask questions to a, what has been an excellent panel. Some very interesting international and, and India dimensions. So the floor is open. We have uh, 10 minutes. Let me take... Um, Three questions, raise your hand, uh, identify yourself, what you are studying or what, what you're doing, and then speak very loudly because we've got an international or an audience which is very far away also. Um, good afternoon, ma'am. I am Tavleen Kaur, and uh, I am a second year student of MSc Economics. Uh, my question is for Dr. Jha. Uh, ma'am, I'd like to quote uh, the latest Oxfam report, which says that the richest 1% in India now own more than 40% of the country's total wealth, while the bottom half of the population together share just 3% of the wealth. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the major part of the GST came from the bottom 50% of the population in 2021-22, with only 3% of the GST coming from the top 10%. So, ma'am, my question to you is that uh, as an economist, um, budget 2023 is around the corner, and we could say that it is the first budget post the pandemic, post the COVID pandemic. And considering that there are still challenges uh, to the Indian economy, such as the Ukraine-Russian war, what are your expectations from the government to reduce this income inequality that exists in India? Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll take uh, one other question or maybe two other questions before I pass it back to the panel. Yeah, right here in front. Speak loudly and clearly into the mic. No, it's not working. Hello. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Ah, yes. So, um, um, I am Abhinav. I am doing my first year uh, master's at SSE. So, uh, my question is uh, regarding uh, now with... Uh, uh, after the COVID-19 thing and after a lot of layoffs happened in the uh, uh, formal manufacturing sector and many people shifted to agriculture and uh, and you know uh, in agriculture also the uh, wage rates in agriculture have been steadily dropping. 
so people have been trying to for uh, alternate sources of income like they are uh, trying to take up uh, uh, small gigs of work now you know uh, uh, doing you know uh, small delivery services or something that j j just to you know sustain themselves their family and stuff like that so uh, how uh, and you know uh, these gig economies don't have any uh, labor laws they 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 have no protection for the uh, workers who have done no proper um, uh, you know insurance nothing is given to them so in such a state how do you think uh, uh, this uh, economy should evolve so that it becomes beneficial to both the workers and the um, uh, firms who employ them what kind of policies what kind of regulation should come into play so that the workers can be protected and the firms can still make profit good thank you very much i'll take one more question quickly are there any other or should i hand it back to the panel okay um dr cha you want to take the first question and then i'm going to ask uh, dr hasan to answer the second one is that okay rana sure okay yes. um okay hi tavleen um thank you for the question it was very you you covered a lot of ground um it's uh, so it's not really the first budget after the pandemic um we have seen budgets where uh, we saw um um steps taken or offers made wherein uh, it was uh, people tried to the government tried to offer support to the people so we won't discuss the previous budgets um i think the need of the hour we have heard this twice today uh, in in different panels is to boost demand we are in a situation where um demand has been falling short consumer sentiments have been um ha 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 we we're not seeing a steady improvement in consumer sentiments and what is the first thing you need to boost demand is to um is to have income money in your pockets right and uh i uh, we have again heard this several times over the uh, over today and yesterday and i also mentioned that real wages have been seeing a steady drop um uh, for for a, for a vast population um so if our wages are going down increasing consumption becomes um a tricky issue right so um i would hope for one that in this upcoming budget measures are taken so that in effect people get more money in their pockets which can get translated into a higher consumption and we see um, better statistics going forward um yeah thanks Rana, Rana, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Santoshi. Um, so it's it's really an excellent uh, question, and I think it's uh, it's it's a question which actually it's um, uh, obviously very pertinent during the times of uh, a shock like the pandemic. But I think it's it's even broader. And uh, I would just say that you know um, we really need to move to social protection systems in India, which are not so centered on the firm. uh we've tried it i don't think it works uh you know we 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 say that the formal sector firm should be the one providing healthcare benefits through that employee you know the esi system it has not worked uh you we 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 then say that okay to protect the worker you're going to disallow uh firms from uh, uh, uh laying off workers you need government permission it hasn't worked um you know in fact it's had these very perverse effects where firms have uh, gone ahead and you know uh, gotten into very capital intensive uh, sectors uh, they've actually ended up using more capital intensive technologies to conserve on workers and and this is all happening in a labor intensive uh, 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 economy uh, we we have created this system where it is profitable for a firm to get, bypass all these attempts and and go and manufacture capital uh, intensive stuff or use capital intensive technologies so i i think we have to uh, get out of this mindset of putting the burden on the firms because the reality is we are not able to regulate we're not able to monitor you know there's really no point in putting together regulations and saying firms should do this and firms should do that if you can't enforce it so we really whenever you're thinking about design of anything 
I would urge everyone, first think, can you enforce it? Let's not assume we're in Sweden. We're not Sweden, we're not Norway. Don't, don't imagine our bureaucracy is, is like that. We, we are a developing country and we need to be realistic. Uh, so what I think is, um, uh, what I see, I, I see steps in the right direction. You know, we were talking about one nation, one ration card. Uh, we are talking about uh, uh, not having social protection tied to the location that you're living in. You know, it's one country. Uh, workers should be mobile. I mean, the fact of development is people move to where the jobs are. Uh, you know, I've been looking at cities for a long time, and, and the idea that every location in your economy is going to grow uh, is just a fantasy. I mean, uh, you know, Arthur Lewis, the Nobel laureate, he put it so beautifully in a speech uh, he'd given, I think, sometime in the 80s. Development is an inegalitarian process. Uh, a, a cocoa uh, mine is found in certain parts. An IT boom takes place in Bangalore. Um, soccer balls are made in Sialkot. Uh, garment factories come up in certain locations. That's reality. Uh, the, 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 the Chinese manufacturing uh, workshops came up in the eastern seaboard near Shenzhen, uh, Shanghai, et cetera. That's, that's how things work. You need to make sure that your workers are mobile. And in that sense, I think um, all these efforts that we're making, we're using digital technologies to get social protection schemes directly to individuals, not tied to its firms, is very important. Firms should be paying their taxes, though. You know, I just want to end on one point, which is just to remind people or, 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 or uh, inform that, you know, for example, in the United States, uh, firms, uh, they, 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 they're, they're free to lay off workers. But a firm that lays off more workers has to pay higher insurance premiums. So, so, you know, the unemployment uh, 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 premiums, it's, uh, you, you pay basically individuals pay taxes, firms pay taxes. And if you're a firm that goes on laying off uh, workers and, 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 and thereby, you know, forcing your workers to go and tap into the public pool for unemployment benefits, you should be penalized more. So, you know, that's, that's the kind of system you want to move towards. So I'll just end with, 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 with that point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rana. Um, Actually, you've made such an important point, so let me sort of pick on that, uh, uh, use my position as chair to just say that it's absolutely critical that we should use this COVID opportunity to think very hard in our country to ensure that this 90% of our workforce, which is informal, i.e. 90% of our workforce has no social insurance, it has no old age pension, it has no death and disability insurance, and it has practically no maternity benefit. And uh, it's perfectly possible for even an economy at our level of per, per capita income to actually provide for social insurance in all these three dimensions for all our 90% of our workers, regardless of whether we involve the firm, because it's, perfe it's perfectly possible to design that I did a paper, in fact, in 2021 for the Asian Development Bank on precisely the possible design for doing this. And it's, it's for us, it's perfectly easy to actually finance it. Uh, but anyway, I, I just want to emphasize that we are a highly informalized economy. We are at levels of informality that you find in Africa. Our demographic dividend will be over in 15 to 18 years, and we cannot afford to go on like this. Um, since we've so far left Lisa out of this whole discussion, Lisa, if I might put a question to you. Um, you see, uh, I, I was in Vietnam about a month ago, and Vietnam was known till pre-COVID times as an economy in Southeast Asia as perhaps the only economy which had seen a decline in informality. And that decline in informality had happened over the preceding eight or nine years because uh, large companies had set up plants in Vietnam uh, with a view to export to the rest of the world. And because of that, formal employment in manufacturing was growing rapidly. As a result of that, the share of total employment, which was informal, was falling, and the share of formal employment in manufacturing rose, which impacted overall informality. In other words, it brought it down. 
Now, do you find, and we found, I mean, I, I found evidence post -COVID, from the post-COVID data, from the labor force data, which suggests that we've gone back to an earlier trend of informality. In other words, informality increased. What does your own work suggest, Lisa? Uh, Thank you for the question. It's a, a lovely way to bring uh, uh, back this more international dimension uh, and the role of informality, the role of uh, surplus labor, uh, given that Ran has cited Lewis, I think it's uh, important to remind us of the structural connection between formal and informal, the agricultural sector and the urban sector, uh, but also the informal sector and the formal sector. And uh, it's not surprising that when we see these terrible shocks, uh, whether it's a pandemic or whether it's a global financial crisis, we actually rely on the agricultural sector, on the informal sector to support the normal people's lives. We have seen it during the global financial crisis where millions of workers in China were sent back to the rural areas where they were coming from. And we have seen it again all over Asia, all over the world, when the formal sector, these global production networks are hit, uh, workers are sent back to the informal sector that they try to escape. So there's a, a something structural there in the way contemporary capitalist uh, uh, economies work. They still need to rely on the informal economy. And this a need of the informal sector that we really need to better understand. Uh, the informal sector is not a residue from the past that is going to disappear as we move towards a more and more complex uh, capitalist uh, uh, driven and capitalist structures. Rather, they will remain and they will come back again to haunt our development, our, you know, the, the social dimensions of development that we care about again and again. So you're very, very right. And understanding informality in Vietnam and elsewhere really means to understand the two major factors. There is a push factor and there is a pull factor. So even if we address taxation and so on, there is also um, you know, a, a pull factor that drive people to adopt informal ways of employing other people or informal employment, self-employment for themselves. So these are real challenges. But uh, um, my answer to you is that my studies tend to focus on the relation, the structural relationships between the two, rather than the contingent, the business cycle relationship between the two. And it's this kind of connection that we need to better understand. Thank you, Dr. Lisa, and thank you, Rana, and thank you, Mrinalini. We've run over time. Uh, very grateful to all three of you for being so disciplined, for keeping to time. We've just run over four, four o'clock and we've got to move on to the next session here. So thank you again, all of you, and goodbye. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, bye-bye. So that's how the session concludes. And on behalf of the organizing, conference organizing committee and Symbiosis School of Economics, we extend our heartfelt gratitude to Professor uh, Santos Mehrotra for moderating the session. Yes, we faced some challenges in the beginning, but we managed it. Uh, we also would like to thank uh, all our keynote speakers, starting from uh, Professor Lisa from Australia, then Dr. Rana Hassan uh, remotely also, and we'd also would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Milan Lee for the last minute request, accepting the last minute request. So I would like to call upon uh, our director and Dean, Professor Jyoti Chandiramani on stage to felicitate uh, uh, Dr. Mrinani.
Thank you, everyone. So a lot of hard work has gone in behind the scenes for this conference to you know, come to what it is today. So I have this honor to call upon Jyoti Ma'am to give her validatory address. Ma'am, please come. Thank you, Dr. Deepa. It's not a valedictory address, it's a valedictory report, all right? <laughs> um, I don't work in labor, uh, but I've always felt that as a school of economics, we needed to concentrate on some aspect of research. And therefore, in 2019-20, when we were making our 10th year plan, we decided that it would be employment. And that's what happened in 2019-20. Um, in fact, 2018-19, I'm sorry. And thereafter, uh, as you heard yesterday, we had COVID for two years. And we really got back into normalcy this year. Uh, the conference has been a fantastic uh, outcome. We've had almost 15 to 17 speakers, discussions, 45 to 48 papers uh, across five parallel tracks that have happened. And uh, it's going to translate into a lot of learning. Uh, we've had this opportunity to hear so many people over the last two days. And I begin with the inaugural address where Dr. Alak Sharma talked about the factors leading to the current employment scenario in the country. He highlighted that high rate of growth has impacted Indian labor market, causing a slow reduction in employment in agriculture and an increase in that of services, while the share of manufacturing is almost constant. He said that despite the rise in labor productivity in almost all sectors, Due to increasing capital intensity, we talked about the KLN, KLNT, so how you know, capital intensity and technology have gone up, but overall growth is becoming less employment intensive. Um, he highlighted the following challenges for employment, um, the increasing educated youth unemployed, declining women's work participation rates, but increasing unemployment, low levels of education and skill, uncertainty brought on by new technologies and digitization, and maybe new jobs that are going to emerge out of that. Satoshi Sakasi, uh, Sasaki from ILO, he you know, talked about the policy framework. He talked about how we need to adopt more inclusive and sustainable employment. He stated that coordinated employment and social protection strategies to facilitate just transitions. The just transitions is what I really want to emphasize. And that if the public, private, domestic, and international resources need to be mobilized to facilitate international strategies, including those for protection of workers in the workplace. He also highlighted how uh, women employment, women-based development has to be at the core of India if India needs to move from 75 onwards with a gender-based, you know, um, with, with lack of discrimination in gender-based employment opportunities and transformation into a green economy. Dr. Santosh Mehrotra, the keynote speaker for the inaugural track, he talked about how India's demographic dividend, while he, he emphasized the importance of, the, of demographic dividend and said that if that was not realized by 2040, we have very limited time. Uh, it will be a missed opportunity. Uh, because a third of the population will be below 35 years of age. He talked about the reverse structure, structural change that is happening, how people have gone back into agriculture uh, during the time of the pandemic. And so while uh, he, 
you know, the demographic groups have different uh, job crises and different segments of society are at risk. He said we need to look at the job crisis for small and marginal farmers, youth and women in particular. Our Vice Chancellor, Dr. Rajni Gupte, raised the issue of the gap between the adequate rise in the number of women in higher education and the decline in the overall female labor force participation rate. And she also pointed out that due to the fall in job security witnessed by the global labor markets, people now post-COVID will tend to shift jobs at higher rate. Um, Dr. Vidya Yarvadika shared in her message a massive challenge for academicians to effectively mark all the plausible issues faced in the labor market and employment levels in the economy. She said that there are so many variables and the macroeconomic indicators like growth, fiscal stimulus, inflation, et cetera, all do Im impact employment and critically mentioned that post the pandemic, the use of technology that has increased dramatically uh, has put the education sector under significant stress. While praising the presence of AI in this field, she was stressing on the point that face-to-face -face education is important as it facilitates social development of students. In the keynote address by Mahesh Vyas in track one, he talked about how unemployment is really brushed under the carpet or employment is not discussed and uh, in the monetary and fiscal policies, the manner in which it should be. And his perspective on employment scenario, scenario is based on the data from CMIE, the Consumer Pyramid Household Survey, which many of you go through trainings uh, to understand these um, databases. He stressed the need to shift employment rates and numbers from the background into the forefront. Um, he also felt that good jobs which pay well and require skills in the manufacturing sector took a hit during demonetization and never recovered and the pandemic exasperated those problems. Uh, he also talked about how MSMEs do not really generate efficient levels of employment of both labor and capital. Uh, he concluded that a focus on employment is needed as the youth entering the job market have a higher rate of unemployment, uh, which was also um, highlighted by many other speakers. Dr. Kundu, distinguished fellow with WRI, uh, he illustrated how unemployment rate in India from 1990 to 2019 was almost constant and it looked at, at the, around that 5 to 6% range but took a spike in 2021. Uh, um, he talked about the rural urban migration in India is not culminating in the existing cities but in the newly created 2,800 census towns. He talked about census activism and of course he, he highlighted the point being an urban economist about how cities would be the future for job creation that is tied to like three new census towns that get created. They would really create the new jobs because infrastructure will come there and maybe you'll see a shift in um, economic activity in these cities. Uh, Dr. Umarani, senior economist at the ILO, shared her research on platformization in developing countries, the informality, precarity, and inequality. The rise in digital labor platforms across the globe has allowed for opportunities to work to be made available 24-7. India is the biggest hub for this, and three narratives can explain the same. Microtask, freelance, and a case study of taxi drivers. Most platform micro workers are young, below the age of 35, highly educated, and most of them are men. Their employment situations raise fundamental questions regarding the nature of work and working conditions. Based on her survey, the problems she stressed were that earnings are very low, workers can be misclassified, and they do not get any work-related benefits or social protection. Dr. Ravi Srinivas, um, the director of, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, Dr. Ravi Srivastava, thank you. I, I realized when I was reading his name that I got it wrong this time and I was a little phased. Thank you for correcting me. Dr. Ravi Srivastava, he talked about um, employment, formal sector, formalization, evidences from employment survey. 
He utilized data from the period 2004, 5, 11, 12, 17, 18, 2021 20, to explain the themes of formal and informal workers in the formal sector. Total employment in the formal sector, the percentage shares in total employment, the percentage shares in total non-agricultural employment, and the employment by the enterprise. Um, he ended that the long-term employment crisis, despite the overall increase in employment, and emphasized that we need strategies and policies that will provide more space for smaller, labor-intensive enterprises to grow and formalize. Dr. Kalyan Shankar ventured into relatively stigmatized issues concerning the three highly marginalized segments that he works on, female labor in the informal sector, that is sex workers, farm widows, and waste pickers. He pointed out that the right to waste versus right against waste movement will shape the urban environment around us for years to come. Uh, he talked about waste because livelihoods depends on unconditional access to waste, but it is highly likely that dominant private players can take over the authorities and benefits that come from waste collection and processing. This session, uh, we had Dr. Saikat Sina Roy, who talked about the share of informal sector, which is as high as 90% of the Indian economy. He emphasized the various factors that had affected the status of different employment sectors, the process of deregulation of the informal sector, demonetization, GST, and the prolonged impact of COVID-19. So all these crises have widened the gap between informal and formal wages too. In track three, we had Dr. Ashwini Deshpande introduce the concept of reproductive labor, household chores, providing emotional support to the family, looking after children, and all the other household work that women do, which is unpaid in character. She pointed out that women are unable to supply labor due to several socioeconomic constraints, uh, like marriage, motherhood, uh, patriarchal norms, sexual violence, etc. And she said that the female labor force participation rate has never exceeded 40% to date, and that Indian women are not a homogeneous entity from an economic point of view. In her address, Dr. Ritu Divan highlighted the many imbalances between the demand and supply of labor in India. She pointed out again that when demonetization was announced, there was an unprecedented impact again on the informal labor market with a specific focus on construction work, workers who were generally given their wages daily in cash, ensuring their daily subsistence and survival. They were the hardest hit at that point of time. Then came COVID and then various, uh, that again accentuated the issues for the informal sector. Um, and generally, the, like uh, the COVID-19, Farm Act's neg negligible increase in minimum support prices of agricultural products, and 2019 labor codes, and inherently work against informal labor as a group, and women and minorities in particular, have made their environment increasingly challenging. So you have observed that while there are different tracks, but the conclusions that come out of them more or less converge to the key characteristics of the employment sector in India. Dr. Radhika Kapoor uh, explained how labor regulation, which looked rigid and binding on paper, were actually very flexible on the ground. The issue to be discussed should be de jure rigidity or but de facto flexibility. She elaborated on trends in the manufacturing sector where employment growth has come from the growth in contract workers employed. This is a strategy to circumvent labor regulation along with other strategies like changing the legal status of workers so that they are no longer in a position to bargain. And the increase in the number of contractual laborers also make it difficult for the regular laborers to negotiate for higher wages. Uh, Dr. Sandhya Iyer, in her remarks, pointed out with an argument for the need to revisit the paradigm and pillars of social security provisions to align to 21st century challenges. Uh, we are all aware of the challenges that there have been in the 21st century, and it again goes back to demonetization and uh, uh, you know the pandemic 
and of course technology that has accentuated a lot of other things. And of course now the war that has been there, the Ukraine-Russia war. So she said, pointed out that in an era of demographic dividend and an IT boom, the youth and educated were not able to get absorbed in jobs. She identified the key, key problems to social security as the demographic balance between uh, being affected by wars and natural disasters and economic uncertainty, unrest and inequalities. Um, it's really time to move from freedom from want ideology to an economic security framework. And that economic insecurity for so many has demonstrated that we are not developed and privatized enough. We then come to the last track where we had Mridalini Jha who, who gave her comments and she talked about, uh, I'm just gathering my notes, so she talked about how, um, you know, um, the impact on employment on casual workers, especially in the pandemic period, and realized that right up to December 2021, um, there was hardly any change in their uh, living conditions. Poverty levels remained even um, after two years. Increasing inequalities during lockdown could be seen. And the poorer you were, the harsher was the recovery. The richer you were, there was a stagnancy in recovery. The more informal and more contracted your job was, the worse the recovery was for you. And um, only talked about income recovery, but not about indebtedness. And therefore, that was one aspect that, was, uh, that had not been addressed. And uh, this, she highlighted, was required. Uh, Lisa McNanny talked about how global value change, she talked about deindustrialization that has happened um, uh, across the, many parts of the world. And then she highlighted how uh, Korea and Brazil, uh, the deindustrialization was much larger, but found that in Vietnam, uh, things had kind of strengthened because global production uh, network in both Vietnam and Indonesia had increased. Economic structures relying on MSMEs, it has actually emerged in an uh, Asia manufacturing, they have emerged as Asia manufacturing powerhouses. And that brought us to the last speaker uh, that was uh, Rana. And Rana talked about how uh, things have changed in terms of, uh, uh, he had highlighted how things have changed with respect to uh, the contributions of different sectors. Uh, he said how consumption has become the main sector. He talked about the period between, um, yeah, the 2002 to 2010 period and 2012 to 2019 period. In the earlier period, he said how private consumption, government consumption, investment and exports all contributed to growth and also to employment. But in 2012 and 19, he felt it was only private consumption and government consumption with investment and exports having declined. This was uh, his study that he had taken from Sajid Chinoy's work. Uh, moving ahead, he too was the opinion like Kundu that there is future in, in urban. Urban employment needs to be enhanced and therefore urban infrastructure, urban job opportunities need to look up. Given these aspects, I come to the end of the report and thank you for your patient listening. Um, after two days of uh, listening to intellectual inputs coming in, we sum up this report and come out with a very detailed report like we had FICO 1. We'll have FICO 2, which will be shared with you within a month. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. A well-summarized report is a takeaway for young minds here from this conference. May I now request Sudipa, ma'am, to come over and announce the best paper awards. Hello, everyone. So our final moments after the two days of academic frenzy and the suspense comes to an end. So let me take this opportunity and announce the winners of each track. We also have some of the dignitaries here with us, so they're going to do the honors. So let me first call upon Professor James West to give out the certificate for track 
one. So the track one was on macroeconomic implications of employment. And the winner is Srishti Rawat of IGIDR Bombay. <laughs> I still call it Bombay, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, Professor James West. Can I call upon Dr. Mrinali Licha to please come up? <laughs> so track two, employment in the informal sector. And the best paper goes to Rajeshi Chaudhary, Shimon Tinidas, and Saikat Sinharoy. Come up. <laughs> Shirkata, come. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I must be. <laughs> May I please call upon Professor Saikat Sinaroy to come up for the next track? Track three was on women and employment. The winner is Meher Kaul Purvash Nayak Suddhasil Siddhant from Gokhale Institute. They're not there. Oh, you, Varun, come and take it if you want. <laughs> Anybody from Gokhale? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Professor Subrata Sarkar. So now, track four, labor market practices, policies, and reforms. Professor Subrata Sarkar, by the way, he is my PhD supervisor of ages back. <laughs> and the best paper goes to Tirtha Chatterjee of O.P. Jindal Global University. I think she came online, so we have to send this to her. Yeah, yeah, Mrinalini can take it, yes. Yes, there's one more track which will be given out by Professor Jyoti Chandi Ramani. <laughs> so track five, COVID-19 and changing employment scenario. The winner is Arokyam Kulandai and Murali are from St. Joseph's College, Tamil Nadu. He's here. Thank you, everyone. And finally, if we go to, comes to an end. Thank you. Thank you.